Good morning, my uh, YouTube viewers. It's Crystal here. I'm just here because I wanted to do another code review for you. And um, basically, I'm using a data set regarding heart disease in the code review. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare logistic regression to the decision tree and see which one works best. So I wrote this program in Google Colab, which is Google's free online Jupyter Notebook. Uh, the only thing that I don't like about Google Colab is it doesn't have an undo function. And because it doesn't have an undo function, you have to be careful not to delete or overwrite code. If you do happen to delete or overwrite code, there's a possibility that you can go back into your save history and find the code in the save history. So that's how you can get code back if you accidentally delete it or override it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import our libraries. So we're going to import NumPy as NP, we're going to import Pandas as PD, we're going to import matplotlive.pyplot as PLT, and we're going to import Seaborn as SNS. We're going to import our warnings, and we're going to set it up so that we can ignore the warnings. And the reason why is because I used Grid Search CV, and when I used Grid Search CV, I got a lot of warnings, so I wanted to be able to ignore them. So after we've uh, imported our libraries, what we're going to do is we're going to load our data set. And we've got this data set off of GitHub, somebody's GitHub account. So, so we can see it's a heart disease data set. You have 918 rows by 12 columns. And you can see that it's a mixture of object columns and numerical columns. So we're going to check for any null values. We do not have any null values in this data set. So now what we're going to do is we're going to and we're going to take the data set and we're going to convert it to a data frame using Panda's readpd.readcsv function to convert the data set to a data frame. And then what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the data frame. So I use the describe function and the include all. So you can see the um, all of the columns and even the columns that are object columns. Because if you include all of the columns, including the object columns, then you get the unique values, you get the top value, and you get the frequency. So that's a good a good way to analyze all of the columns and not just the numeric columns. Now what we're going to do is we're going to get some information about this data frame. And as I said before, all of the columns are either object or numeric. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find the number of unique values in each object column and we're going to do that with a for loop for call in df if df call dot d type equals object print call comma df call dot in unique and then so you can see each column that is an object column it tells you how many unique values are in each column for in instance sex has um two unique values male or female exercise and china has two unique values called yes or no and then chest pain type has four unique values resting ecg has three unique values and st slope has three unique values then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do another for loop and we're going to get the unique values from each of the object columns. So, so sex has M or F for male and female, chest pain type as ATA, NAP, ASY, and TA. I don't know what that means because I'm not medically trained. Resting EGC 
ECG is normal ST and LVH, and I don't know what that means. Exercise and jhana is no or yes, or N or Y, which means no or yes. And ST slope is up, flat, and down. So I don't know what that means. So what we want to do is we want to do a hist plot on heart disease, which is your target. And so you can see that you have more people that have heart disease than don't have heart disease. And so we do a value counts to find out that you've got 508 people with heart disease and 410 people without heart disease. Now we do a hist plot on sex, and you can see that there are more men than women. So you have 725 men by 193 women. We do a hist plot on exercise angina. So more people don't have exercise angina than do. You have 547 no's and 371 yeses. We do a hist plot on ST slope. So you can see what the percentage of the ST slope is as well. So I decided to insert a pie plot in here because pie plots are good if you have more than four or five uh, classes. So if you have more than four or five classes, they say it's best to use a pie plot. So I used a pie plot on chest pain type and you can see that more than half of the chest pain types are ASY. And I did this pie plot in only one column, but one row, one line of code. But if you wanted to use more lines of code, you could make it a lot more, um, like you could put percentages in there and you could make an explode and all kinds of stuff. But I just wanted one type line of code. So we do a value count so you can see how many people have ASY, NAP, ATA, and TA. Now we're going to do a resting ECT, which has uh, three classes, but um, I made that a pie plot as well. And you can see normal is 552, LVH is 188, and ST is 178. Now what we're going to do is we're going to encode all of the columns that um, are object columns. So, so we have to import our pre, from sklearn import preprocessing and from sklearn dot preprocessing import ordinal encoder. So for call in df, if df call dot dtype equals object, df call equals ordinal encoder brackets dot fit transform brackets df calls dot values dot reshape negative one comp one so one thing that i want you to know about ordinal encoder is it will encode object columns but it won't encode um categorical columns so if you have a categorical column you have to convert the categorical column to a string which will make it an object font column and that way it will be encoded so now that you can see then after we have encoded all of our object columns they have been in converted into numbers we check our info again and you can see it's all all the columns are numeric which is what we wanted. We wanted all of them to be numeric. Now we're going to create a heat map. So core equals df dot core brackets sns dot heat map core. So you can see we've got a heat map. The dark colored cells means it has a low correlation and the light colored cells means it has a high correlation. So I printed off the core so you can see how every uh, row has a correlation to itself and other rows as well. So every row has a correlation to another row and they've taken the rows and converted them to columns as well. Or they've taken the columns and converted them to rows, I should say. So now what we want to do is we want to print off all of the rows 
that have a high correlation to a column. But in this instance, uh, we didn't have any rows that had a high correlation to a column. So nothing was printed out. But there's the code if you want to use it for row and core colon for call in core colon if core dot loc square brackets row comma colon square brackets is greater than 0 0.9 and then you go if core dot loc square brackets row comma code square brackets does not equal one colon print call comma core dot loc square brackets row comma Call. And then so what you'll, will happen is if you have any row and column that has a correlation that is greater than 0.9 and does not equal 1, then it will print that out. But in this instance, none printed out. And that's just to give you an idea of the rows and columns that have a high correlation to each other. And in this particular example, they don't have a high correlation to each other. And then what we're going to do is we're going to normalize the data. And we have to normalize the data by taking the target and defining it as DF heart disease. And then we have to drop heart disease from the target and then we have to normalize sorry we drop yeah we drop heart disease from the data frame and then we have to normalize the data frame using our formula for normalization and then we have to put heart disease back into the data frame and make it the target. And that's how we had to do it because we needed to normalize the data. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create a train and validation sets. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to create the train set first, which is a randomized sample of the data frame of 90% and it's got a random state of 42 and then the val is equal to df.dropTrain.index so the val is going to be the remaining 10% because it's going to drop all of the rows that are comprised of the train and then what we're going to do is we're going to create our y train x train and y val x val so y train equals the last column of train and x train equals all of the columns except for the last one in train and y val equals the last column in val and x val equals all of the columns in val except for the last one and then we're going to print out the shape because we want to see what the shape is to make sure that we have done it correctly so now what we're going to do is we're going to define our model which is logistic regression and in this instance we're going to use grid search cv so we're going to use grid search cv to find the best parameters for logistic regression and in this instance c is 1 max eider is 100 penalty is f1 solver is saka so we put all that information into the model and we had 86 percent accuracy when we trained and when we trained and fitted x trained y trained and now we're going to predict on the model and we're going to have 70 9% accuracy when we predict on XVAL. Now we're going to put it into the confusion matrix and you can see we had 32 positives and 3 false positives and we had 41 1, no we had 32 zeros and three false zeros and we had 41 ones and 16 false ones and so what that means is this logistic regression didn't do 100 percent and so then we put the um we use a classification report 
and we check our precision. So on the precision, on the zeros, we had 91% accuracy on precision, 67% accuracy on recall, and 77% accuracy on um, F1 score. And you had 48, 48 zeros. And on one, you had 72% accuracy on precision, 93% accuracy on recall, and 81% accuracy on F1 score. And you had 44 uh, ones. And then your accuracy, your macro average, and your weighted average, that gives you some metrics as well. But in your validation set, you had a total of 92 rows of data. 48 being 0 and 44 being 1. So now we're going to do something called the ROC score. And what this ROC score is, I just learned how to do it. I just got the code to do it. But what it does is it checks the accuracy for the thresholds. And the thresholds um, are based on the predict proba. And so what we're going to do is at the end of this code review, we'll be talking about the ROC a little bit more because I'm not, this is the first time I've really made an ROC, so I'm not 100% on it, which is what I wanted to do, which is why I wanted to do this code review, basically to talk about the ROC. But we're going to select our next model, which is the decision tree. And the thing about the decision tree is you have to be careful with overfitting. So you can see that when we trained and fitted our data into the decision tree classifier, we had 100% accuracy, which was fantastic. But when we predicted on the validation set, we only had 76% accuracy. And so that means that this decision tree classifier had a tendency to overfit the data, which that's one of the problems with a decision tree classifier. And you can see that the prediction on the validation is less for decision tree, is less than the prediction on the um, logistic regression because in my opinion, logistic regression doesn't always perform the best, but in this instance, even though when logistic regression trained and fitted the data into the model, it didn't have a as high a score as it did on decision tree classifier, when it uh, predicted on the validation set, it had a higher score than it did on the decision tree classifier. So in this instance, the logistic regression gives you better accuracy. And then we, so we put our decision tree into a uh, confusion matrix, and you can see that you had um, more uh, false zeros than you had false ones. And you can see in the classification report, it did not score as well as it did on logistic regression. And you can see that when we carried out our receiver operating characteristics, um, it looked a bit funny, really. And the area was 76%, whereas on logistic regression, the area was 80%. So logistic regression performed better on receiver operating characteristic. So what we'll do here is this was the first time that I've done ROC. And uh, so because it's the first time that I've done ROC, um, I can't, I'm not, I don't know a lot about it, which is why I wanted to do the code review because if I'm just now learning about how to do ROC, many of my viewers are just learning how to use it, do it as well. So the function ROC curve computes the receiver operating characteristic curve or ROC curve, quoting with Wikipedia. 
a receiver operating characteristic RLC or simply RLC curve is a graphical plot which illustrates the performance of a binary classifier system as its discrimination threshold is varied. It is created by plotting the fraction of true positives out of the positives, TPR equals true positive rate, versus the fraction of false positives out of the negatives, FPR equals false positive rate at various threshold settings. TPR is also known as sensitivity and FPR is 1 minus the specificity or true negative rate. This in function requires the true binary value and target scores which can be either probability estimates of the positive class, confidence values, or binary decisions. Here is a small example of how to use the ROC curve. And so they give you an example of how to use the ROC curve in sklearn, and it's not that different from the ROC curve that I made on this code. So I still don't know a lot about ROC curves. I guess I'll have to be working with them a lot and studying them a lot before um, I become more knowledgeable on it. Um, I would like to write a blog post on ROC curves, but I think I need to work with them more uh, before I make a blog post on ROC curves because it's the first time I've ever used them. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude this video. I would like to thank all of my subscribers for supporting my channel. If you like, if you like my video, please like, subscribe, and share. And um, thank you so much for watching this video. I plan on doing more code reviews for you in the future.